and welcome back to Voyage of a Time Wanderer. Today I am here to share my middle grade March TBR. So Middle Grade March is an annual readathon hosted by Katie from Life Between Words, Amanda from The Curly Reader, and Krista from Krista Books and Jams. And it is a month-long read-along celebrating middle grade literature. I don't typically read a ton of middle grade literature, but there was a couple that I had been meaning to get to soon and already had on my TBR for the month, so I thought I would add a couple more middle grade books and join in for the month-long reading fun. So I have six books that I'm specifically hoping to read for middle grade March this year. Obviously I have a super long March TBR that includes all the rest of the books that I want to read, but today I'm just going to be talking about the books that I'm hoping to read in March that tie into middle grade March. So the hosts have put together five prompts for this middle grade March, and to be honest I didn't look at the prompts before uh, pulling my books together and choosing which titles I was interested in reading. But when I went back and looked at the prompts, I saw that I could kind of make most of my books work for them. So I'm going to be going through the prompts and sharing the six books that I'm hoping to read this coming month. So the first prompt is to read a book with five or more words in the title. And the book that I'm pigeonholing into that square is one that I think maybe is more children's literature than middle grade, but uh, I'm choosing it anyway. And that is this nonfiction book, All in a Drop, How Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek Discovered an Invisible World, and this is a uh, children's or middle grade nonfiction, and it is the story of Antony van Leeuwenhoek. This is a book that is kind of relevant to my Reading Through My Family Tree Dutch Golden Age series that I'm working through right now because this is a book obviously set during the Dutch Golden Age. So Antony van Leeuwenhoek is credited with kind of discovering the microscope and specifically discovering germ theory and understanding uh, that there were microorganisms living in our world. Uh, I recently read a rather dense adult nonfiction book on Christian Huygens, who was another Dutch scientist a couple of years after Antony van Leeuwenhoek, and Christian Huygens took the developments that Antony van Leeuwenhoek had made and uh, built on that. So when I saw that my library had got this one in, they just ordered it in in January, I thought it would be kind of fun to have uh, a reading through my family tree connection on my middle grade March TBR. It also has such stunning illustrations. I was flipping through when I got it back. The end papers are Delft tiles. There's this beautiful painting of what Anthony van Leeuwenhoek's scientific cabinet looked like. There's a couple pictures of kind of his town. This was a cool illustration because it actually shows a real pictures through a microscope. Uh, I really liked like this one, just like a little Dutch town scene, or this one that's like a market. So I thought that that would be kind of fun. I already know the basics of Antony van Leeuwenhoek's story, but uh, I'm always up for a refresher and I thought this would be a fun way to do that. The back says, Invisible organisms called microbes are everywhere, in soil, oceans, and snow, in the food we eat, and the air we breathe, even inside our bodies. But in Antony van Leeuwenhoek's time, people believed that what they could see with their own eyes was all that existed in the world. Using microscopes of his own design, Antony discovered a living world no one had seen before. How did a simple tradesman, who didn't go to college or speak English or Latin, like all the other scientists, change everyone's mind? Proving that remarkable discoveries can come from the most unexpected people and places, this Siebert honor-winning chapter book, illustrated with lovely full-color art, celebrates the power of curiosity, ingenuity, and persistence. So that is my nonfiction middle grade pick for this year. And also, if I add in the second part of the title, it has more than five words in the title. Then the second prompt that the hosts made is a book featuring an orphan main character, and this is the one that I didn't really have an obvious pick for when I was looking through the books that I'd selected, but the book that I'm going to kind of attribute to this prompt is The Borrowers Afloat by Mary Norton. This is one of my childhood favorite middle grade series, and I really enjoyed reading through the first two books in the series last year, and so I'm excited to be rereading the third book, The Borrowers Afloat. And while our main character, Arietti, is obviously not an orphan, we have both her father and mother in the story, 
In this book, uh, their friend Spiller plays a prominent part, and Spiller is an orphan, so uh, he's kind of, I would say, maybe the third or fourth major character after Mr. and Mrs. Clock and Arietti. Spiller is uh, definitely a main character in this book, so I think that that kind of counts. This series is a classic work of children's middle grade literature. It was originally published during the 1950s, but the setting is the late Victorian era, so all of the illustrations and some of the different objects and events that they mention are more related to uh, kind of the turn of the 20th century. It is premised around the concept of there being tiny miniature people that live under the floorboards and in the walls of ordinary people's homes. And these tiny people borrow items from average sized people to get the daily essentials that they need. They borrow food, they borrow household objects and turn them into uh, the furniture and clothes and everything that they use. It's obviously a very charming concept because it's dealing with miniature things, which is always super cute. And it's set in the English countryside, so there's always some uh, nice pastoral descriptions of English landscapes. I have the description for this third book in the series up on my phone, and I don't want to read all of it because there's spoilers for the first two books, and if you haven't read the series yet, it's one that you should definitely experience for yourself. But the basic premise of this third book, The Borrowers Afloat, is that the borrowers are having to travel somewhere and the only way that they know how to do that is to go down the drain in a soap dish and then to float down the river in a teapot. So with the help of a wild borrower boy, Spiller, they have to make this harrowing journey and the poor borrowers barely have time enough to catch their breath before flood or famine or their old enemy Milk Eye sends them looking for a new safe place to live. I've always loved the art in the Borrowers series books and particularly this idea of floating down the river in a teapot, so I'm looking forward to being back in the world of the Borrowers for the third book in the series. Then the third prompt is a contemporary book and for this one I have another book that is kind of tying into my Reading Through My Family Tree Dutch Golden Age series and that is Joplin Wishing by Diane Stanley. So this book obviously has a little Dutch girl on the cover and some pieces of pottery that looked kind of Delft inspired. I'll read the flap here. It sounds like a really interesting premise for a book. Joplin never met her famous grandfather, Martin J. Camrath, but she knows he was once a literary superstar. Then at the height of his fame, he dropped out of sight, became a recluse and never published anything again. Something bad must have happened, but Joplin's mother is silent on the subject. There are a lot of family secrets. When he dies, Joplin's world is suddenly turned upside down. Paparazzi camp outside Joplin's apartment. Horrible stories about wild man Camrath appear on the internet and her mother slides into depression. Then there's the mysterious cookie tin she finds in her grandfather's bedroom, filled with fragments of an antique Dutch platter. She has it repaired and hangs it over her bed. The picture on the platter shows a beautiful landscape and an old fashioned Dutch girl about her age who seems as lonely as Joplin feels. She wishes that girl could be her friend. And pretty soon, like Alice, Joplin is tumbling down the rabbit hole into a strange and alarming sort of wonderland. As one surprise follows another and then the impossible becomes real, Joplin and her brand new friend Barrett must find the key that unlocks the very nature of time and a life hangs in the balance. So from what I can gather from looking up this book on the internet, it sounds like this little Dutch girl has somehow been trapped in time on this platter and our modern heroine Joplin has to work with her to travel through time and kind of unlock whatever curse has got her stuck on this piece of pottery. So it has some kind of fantasy time travel elements as well as being partially set in the modern day. Then the fourth prompt that the host had put together is to read a book either set in Asia or with an Asian main character and one of the books that I already had on my radar had an Asian main character so that worked out perfectly. And that book is Orange for the Sunsets by Tina Athaid. This book is set in Uganda during the rule of Idi Amin, particularly during the time when he expelled all uh, people of Indian descent from the country. So I have the description on my phone. A soaring tale of empathy, hope, and resilience. Tina Athaid's unforgettable middle grade debut follows two friends whose lives are transformed by Idi Amin's decision to expel Indians from Uganda in 1972. Twelve-year-old Asha and her best friend Yusuf 
never cared about the differences between them. Indian, African, girl, boy, short, tall. But when Ugandan President Idi Amin announces that Indians have 90 days to leave the country, suddenly these differences are the only things that people in Entebbe can see. Not the shared after-school samosas or Asha cheering for Yusuf at every cricket game. Determined for her life to stay the same, Asha clings to her world tighter than ever before. But Yusuf is torn, pulled between his friends, his family, and a promise that could bring his dreams of university within reach. Now, as neighbors leave and soldiers line the streets, the two friends find that nothing seems sure, not even their friendship. And with only days before the deadline, Asha and Yusuf must decide if the bravest thing of all might be to let each other go. So as I've mentioned in numerous videos before, I am working on a long-term reading through Africa project where I'm trying to read books from every African country and I haven't actually read a book from Uganda yet and so this book will be both uh, crossing off Uganda off that list as well as being a middle grade March title and from what I can look into it looks like the author's family was affected by that. She grew up primarily in the UK but her family were uh, Indian Ugandans who had to leave the country. It's obviously a period in history that had an uh, enormous effect on people in East Africa of Indian descent and so I'm interested to uh, read something that isn't academic about that because I did study uh, this event in university in some of my African studies classes but I've never read like a fictional account or a, a memoir account of how people actually felt that were affected by these policies. Then the fifth and final prompt is to read a book that is older than you are and I have two books that I'm hoping to read for this. So the first book that I'm going to talk about is The Railway Children by E. Nesbitt and this book is the March pick for Kate Howe's Kindred Spirits Club and it is an Edwardian era children's classic that I never read when I was younger. I remember having a copy of this book when I was little and I think I maybe read the first chapter and didn't really enjoy it but I think I'm going to like it more maybe now as an adult. So I have again the description on Goodreads on my phone. In this much loved children's classic first published in 1906, the comfortable lives of three well-mannered siblings are greatly altered when one evening two men arrive at the house and take their father away. With the family's fortune considerably reduced in his absence, the children and their mother are forced to live in a simple country cottage near a railway station. There the young trio, Roberta, Peter, and young Phyllis, befriend the porter and station master. The youngsters' days are filled with adventure and excitement, including their successful attempt to avert a horrible train disaster, but the mysterious disappearance of their father continues to haunt them. The solution to that painful puzzle and many other details and events of the children's lives come to vivid life in this perennial favorite, a story that has captivated generations of readers. So it sounds like there is going to be a little bit of an element of mystery in this book as we kind of wonder along with the children what has happened to their father and the reasons for that and whether or not he is going to be reunited with the family. But at the same time the description almost reminds me a little bit of Sense and Sensibility where we're going to be following this family as they struggle to live on reduced means and have to uh, move into a small cottage and kind of make the best of their life in that situation. And then the sixth book on my TBR and the second book that is older than I am that I'm hoping to read this middle grade March is Betsy Tacey by Maud Hart Lovelace. This is another book that is obviously strongly inspired by Kate Howe's love for this series. The January book pick for her Kindred Spirits Club was Emily of Deep Valley which is more of kind of a young adult uh, book series set in the same world as the Betsy Tacey books and I was absolutely enchanted by Emily of Deep Valley and the characters and setting so I definitely want to go back now and actually read the Betsy Tacey series. This is another series of books that I feel like I kind of missed out on when I was younger because I remember I think reading maybe the first book or at least looking at the first few books in the series at the library and I thought that they were maybe a bit young for me and I didn't realize that the book series grew up with the characters so that the first couple books are quite easy reading and then it turns into more of a young adult series as the characters age into high school and whatnot. I found the first 
three books available online. I think they're out of copyright now in Canada, so I can read the first three books online. They were originally published in the 1940s, so I'm not sure if I'm going to try to read all three of the first books in that bind up, but definitely the first book for sure. And so I have the first book's description pulled up here. Best Friends Forever. There are lots of children on Hill Street, but no little girls Betsy's age. So when a new family moves into the house across the street, Betsy hopes they will have a little girl she can play with. Sure enough, they do, a little girl named Tacy. And from the moment they meet at Betsy's fifth birthday party, Betsy and Tacy become such good friends that everyone starts to think of them as one person, Betsy Tacy. Betsy and Tacy have lots of fun together. They make a playhouse from a piano box, have a sand store, and dress up and go calling. And one day, they come home to a wonderful surprise, a new friend named Tib. So I think ideally I would really love to get those first three books in the series read. They don't look like they're very long and those are the books that are kind of children's middle grade lit and then I'll be into the more mature years in the series where the characters are in high school and college and dealing with all of the issues that come with being in that stage of life. So those are the books that I have on my middle grade March TBR. Obviously I'm hoping to read a lot of other books in March as well but I am looking forward to having uh, a little bit of escape into some middle grade reading. If you're participating in middle grade March, I would love to know what titles you're reading and if you have read any of these and have any thoughts about the titles I have chosen, I would love to hear those as well. Thanks for watching and until next time, enjoy wandering through the pages of a good book. Bye.